And amen. Thank you, Marsh. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, if you guys will hear um, at my voice, I've, I've lost my voice this week. Um, and so I'm going to give it my best. I hope you guys can just be a little bit patient with me. In the first service, it kind of felt like I was driving in first gear. Uh, like I just couldn't quite get out of first gear. I would kind of push it and then just feel it uh, fall off. So the, the team, you know, actually, you know, gin and tonic is like the best thing for, uh, um, you know. No, it's water. It's water. I'm just kidding. It is. It's water. But uh, I will turn to that from time to time here to get through this. But you know, Casey and I, we love you guys so much, and I, I love you so much that I just want to make a promise uh, to you guys. Um, you know, in the summertime, you guys are like my special crowd, because there's a whole bunch of people that come at 8.30 in the summer, and you know what's going to happen? In the wintertime, they're, yeah, they're going to want to come to the 10 o'clock, but guess what? No. It's, 10 o'clock is yours, all right? So you guys are, yeah, yeah, you know, you can... Now, if you're new here to the church, we don't actually keep people out of services. But if you have a friend that goes to the 830 and they won't join you for the 10, because we, we, every chair was full at 830 this morning. And so I know it's amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see that that happen. But, but we want to, you know, if you've got a friend that comes to 830, you're welcome to tease them and tell them that they're not allowed to make the switch in the winter time if they don't make it now. So. All right, let me get into a message that I have for you today. Like I said, Casey and I, we love you so much. And because we love you so much, we pray for you. And, and I mean, we actually, we legitimately really pray for you. And because we pray for you, God speaks to us. And generally, when God speaks to us, it's usually something that's really good. And this message came out of God speaking to me. And it happened, it started to happen months and months and months ago. And it began with an idea around having an irresistible testimony. You know, if we're a Christ follower, if we're a church, then shouldn't what happens in here be irresistible to those that are out there? Uh, otherwise, we, what, what good is it that's, that's here? So I believe that this is some of the best things that can happen in our lives happen here in church as a community together. And I, th I thought about that irresistible testimony, and, and then I had a conversation with a friend, a, a mentor, and, and these words restoration and redemption came up. And then later on, uh, I was in the gym, I was working out, and if, if you were here last week, you heard more of the story. But I was working out, and I, and I just was listening to music, and I heard Zach Williams, he's a, a, a Christian artist, he was singing, uh, he was telling his rescue story, which is his testimony. And then he has a song called Rescue Story. And as I'm listening to that, I'm just, I start bawling, just pouring, just crying like crazy. And this is at Virgin Active, Can I Walk? Um, and there's a lot of people around in the gym at the same time. So I just put my hood over my head, over my head, and I just cried. I just cried, and I tried to lift heavier weight to mix the sweat with the tears. But what was happening in me is something really valuable to me was being touched. I mean, that's, that's what happens when I'm moved to tears. It's something really valuable in me was being directly touched and impacted. And that's where this came from. See, I, I have a rescue story. I'm a survivor. My identity has changed. I'm not lost. I'm not a sinner. I'm not bad. I'm rescued. And because I'm rescued, I'm a survivor. And my rescue story is the story of the moment in time when I made Jesus my Lord and Savior. And he came down and he rescued me out of my sin, out of hopelessness. And he took me and he put me into a relationship and communion with God and him. And so now every day I wake up rescued, I go to bed rescued. I wake up a survivor, I go to bed a survivor. And that means a lot to me. And because it means a lot to me, I, I feel like it should mean a lot to you. You know, I, I spoke last week about uh, a couple encounters that Jesus had where people were rescued by him. And in those encounters, there was something in common with all three of them. One of them was the adulterous woman. And it was about a woman that had been brought before Jesus and she'd been caught in the act of adultery and she was supposed to be stoned. And Jesus, uh, without even really speaking much, he, he ends up rescuing this woman but the special thing about that moment is there's a moment where he stands up and he looks at her eye to eye and he says, do you see anybody around you to condemn you? And she says, no. 
And he says, well, then neither do I. That moment, that eye-to-eye moment between Jesus and her, that, that's the special moment. That's the moment of rescue. Or the moment where Jesus is on the cross and in his last hour, the person, the criminal next to him, calls out to him and says, hey, will you please remember me in heaven? And Jesus looks at him and he says, I will remember you in paradise today. Not later, not maybe, not eventually, not after you pay for your sins, but today, in your dying moment, I accept you into my paradise today. That eye-to-eye moment where those two looked at each other and they saw each other eye-to-eye. What, what did that moment feel like to them? That moment of rescue. And see, that's what I want for you. Last week is rescue. This week, we talk about redemption. Next week, we talk about restoration. And then we're going to rejoice in the last Sunday night in the month where we're going to have a worship night. And we're gonna, people are going to tell their rescue stories. It's going to be an incredibly powerful evening. Because there's nothing more powerful than somebody sharing how God set them free, how God rescued them. And so what I want for you last week, this week, next week, the week after is, is simple. I, I, want, I want you to feel this right here. I want you to come face to face with what it means to be rescued by Jesus. I, I believe that that's what the, the woman caught in adultery felt like. She came face to face with what it means to be rescued. I believe that that's what the man on the cross felt when he was next to Jesus. I believe that this is the thing that's so transformational in my life. See, I can read my Bible all day long, every day. But if I don't have an encounter, a face-to-face encounter with Christ, if I don't have that, then it's just head knowledge. But because I can meet with my Heavenly Father every morning or every night or every evening or whenever and spend time with Him, I can get face-to-face. No, I don't see Him face-to-face. If I drink enough gin and tonics, maybe. Right? You guys are definitely asleep. No one laughed at a gin and tonic joke. You know who laughed at that? The 830 service did. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm kidding. I didn't tell them that joke. But, but I, I want you to, I want, feelings are important. And that's what we're talking about. That, that's that's going to carry us through today. I want you to feel this. I want it to, I want you to feel the emotion of it. Because we get, dis- we get disconnected from our feelings. I want to bring you back into your feelings. Say, that's why I crafted this statement to be exactly this. I want you to come face to face with what it means to be rescued by Jesus. I want you to feel what this means. It's a personal connection face to face. And so, last week we talked about rescued. And there's something that happens the moment that you're rescued. So the moment that you catch the life raft that Jesus throws out to you, you're swimming in the ocean and sharks are all around. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a life raft comes down to you. And the moment you catch it is the moment that you're rescued. At that exact moment, something else really special happens. That's where we go from being rescued to redeemed. And see, we go from rescue to redeem. And to be redeemed, let me explain what this means. So I'll give you the Latin. You know, I took Latin in high school, which now thinking back on that, it's crazy. A, I didn't learn any of it. And B, a, like a 15-year-old learning Latin, how is that applicable to anything? But uh, now I can use it some. So let me give you the Latin for the word redeemed. This is what it means. Redeemed is like a, a, a very much like a Bible word, as we maybe would call it, but has a very simple meaning. It comes from the Latin redimir, and it literally means to buy back. So redeemed is to buy something back. You know, we're going to look at that because redemption is probably one of the most important themes in the Bible. There's a lot of different themes. So if we were to pull a thread from Genesis to Revelations, and every time you kind of pull the thread, it would pull a theme with it, meaning that there are themes like salvation is a theme that goes all the way through the Bible. And redemption is another one of those. It goes all the way through the Bible. God's love is one. There's, there's, a, there's several of them. And redemption is probably one of the most important ones. Let me explain this to you. Let me show it to you a little bit. I'm going to give you uh, like four areas where I feel like that this uh, redemption theme kind of spreads throughout Scripture. The first area would be in redemption from sin. Now, I feel like that this is kind of, this is the no-brainer because we're here in church and this is what we're taught 
all day, every time we come on a Sunday morning, we're taught this very thing, that before you're saved, you're a sinner. And then when you come to Jesus and you pray a prayer, you pray the magic prayer, Lord, come into my heart and save my soul. And then God comes into your heart and your sin is forgiven and then you're redeemed. That, that, that's, the, that's the one that we know more than any of the others. And I'll, I'll show you where that is in Scripture. Let me scripturally kind of break it down for you. I've got two verses for you. Here in Romans 3, verse 23. Since all have sinned and we continually fall short of the glory of God, and we are being justified, declared free of the guilt of sin, made acceptable to God, and granted eternal life. And all this comes as a gift by his precious undeserved grace through, and here it is, the redemption, but look at what that means, the payment for our sin, which is provided in Christ Jesus. So that's, that's Jesus has made that payment for our sin. Now we can look at Ephesians 1, 7 here as well. In him we have redemption. That is the, our deliverance and salvation. So my deliverance from sin, my salvation, meaning I've been rescued. I've grabbed that rescue there. He comes through his blood, which means that's Jesus dying on the cross for us. That's what that's talking about. But that paid the penalty for our sin. And it resulted in the forgiveness, the complete pardon of our sin. And that's in accordance with the riches of his grace. I don't feel like that there's a lot of people that would be surprised at those verses. Because that's a pretty universally taught thing here that's, that we learn about the Bible from when our kids are like, you know, out there in Wombland and stuff all the way up. But there are some other themes of redemption in the Bible as well. One of them, another one is redemption from bondage. And what this is talking about is this is talking about things like being uh, like in slavery. You know, oftentimes somebody would have to sell themselves as a servant or a hired hand in order to pay off a debt. And there were rules in the Bible. There were things that were put there to protect those people. And then you can even look at, okay, here's a big one that we wouldn't maybe think to apply this to, the Israelites. You know, when they were in Egypt, they were enslaved to the Egyptians. They worked for the Egyptians. Moses comes in because God says, go and set my people free. Those people were redeemed from bondage. They were taken out of bondage. Yeah, another redemption thread that we could pull is, is that we have redemption of land and property. Now, I included this in here because I just thought this was really cool. For me, this is an example of loving each other really, really well. This is also an example of how much I think that God loves you and he loves us. See, in, uh, when the Israelites left Egypt, as God was setting up the nation of Israel... He put together, you know, the Ten Commandments. But then they also had a lot of other, you know, rules and regulations and things that were in place. And they were all put there for their own good. And what would happen, there was a rule that was put in place, uh, almost like a really a suggested rule. And it was something around the idea of, um, they call it the kinsman redeemer. So if you were poor or if you had a debt that you couldn't settle and you had to sell your land or your property then it would be up to your closest next of kin or someone in your family to come and buy that property. And then when they bought that property, they would then in turn give it back to you. I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's like God spoke to Moses and said, tell the people this is how this is supposed to happen. And that, to me, that's incredibly loving. That's like incredibly good. And I'll show you the verse. It's in Leviticus here. It says in verse 25, 25, 25, if a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor that he has to sell some of his property, then his nearest relative is to come and buy back or redeem what his relative has sold. Isn't that neat? I, sometimes I just include things in, the Bible, in, in my sermons to you guys just because they're like cool parts of the Bible that maybe we don't talk about or we don't know that much. I just thought that was really cool. The last theme that we'll talk about this morning is spiritual redemption. And this goes a little bit deeper than just um, like forgiveness of your sins. You know, this takes me to Jesus walking around. And one of the things that Jesus did a lot was Jesus dealt with like with demons. Now, I know that we don't like to say the word, you know, demon in our modern day. Even when I say it out loud, it sounds like I should like whisper it. You know, I don't want to... Uh, 
make anyone panic or freak anybody out. But Jesus actually referenced demons more than he referenced heaven. He, he referenced them all the time. But he should, because if Jesus came to save the lost, then most of his time should go towards people that were lost. And people that were lost were people that had, uh, they had struggles, and some of them had struggles with like a demonic spirit. And you can read through the New Testament, and you can see that people would have this kind of spirit on them, and Jesus would have an encounter with them, and he would heal them of that. He would redeem them. And they would have redemption from, from like this dark sort of dominion that they lived in. Another place where this applies is let's say your great, great grandparents get divorced because your grandfather, your great, great grandfather is an alcoholic. Then your great grandparents get divorced because your great grandfather is an alcoholic. Then your grandparents get divorced because your grandfather is an alcoholic. Then your parents get divorced because your father is an alcoholic. But see, because we have this spiritual redemption, that means that you don't have to repeat that. Because that, that stronghold over you and your family can be broken. That through Christ, through Jesus, through our rescue of him or from him, then we can break that off. So now I don't have to worry about that because... I don't have to be an alcoholic. I can stay married to my wife. We can have a good marriage. We can raise good kids. And then now the stronghold that gets passed on in our generation from generation to generation to generation is that of, of Jesus. It's that of love. It's that of having a strong marriage. Because there's spiritual redemption, you can take something in your life like that, like addiction or like divorce or whatever stronghold is in your family, you can cut it off, bring it into it. You can turn around and start fresh and start a whole nother stronghold in your family that centers around Jesus. And then your great, 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 great grandkids. They say, wow, we, we live in a stronghold where Christ is our only stronghold, where Jesus is our provider. He is the reason why this thing works. And that started with you because of this thing here called spiritual redemption. And so that's kind of like a survey of redemption throughout the Bible. But uh, again, I want us to feel redemption. And in order for us to feel it, we have to connect with it in some way. It, it's got to mean something to us personally. And so I, I took the idea of being redeemed, the idea of redemption, and I kind of put it through like a scenario. And I came up with, with three parts to redemption. There's three, it's not three steps to redemption. There's like three key things that are at play when redemption comes to mind. Because anytime something's redeemed, that means there's an exchange of something and there's a price that has to be paid. And so I'm going to walk you through these three parts here. So the first one, I'll let you guys read that while I take a drink of water here. Somebody could read that out loud for everyone. No, I'm kidding. 8.30 would have laughed at that one as well. <laughs> part one. Okay, so the first part of being, uh, of, of redemption, part one, you've got the redeemer. So I call that the coupon. You guys would call that the voucher. Same thing, all right? So what you have here is, is I, I gave an example of this last week. I'll talk about, I'm a little bit upset with you guys or somebody about this because I talked last week about the, the bacon biltong at the quick spar. And then guess what? I went to go get some, and it wasn't there. There was no more left. So, because you guys, somebody went in and got all of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for ruining my week. And then I got sick, and then I dropped my phone, and I broke my phone screen. It's your fault because you took, yeah, because you ate the bacon biltong. So, well, let's say that I go to Quick Spar today, and I get 100 rand of bacon biltong. Two bags, approximately. But when I walk up to the counter, I've got a 20 rand coupon or voucher, and I give them that. Then I'm only responsible for 80 rand of that. Because 20 rand of that has already been paid for me. There is a redeemer. There is a coupon. There's a voucher in place. It speaks for 20 rand. I'm only responsible for what's unspoken for, which is the 80 rand. See, our, our lives are that way with Christ where Jesus is our redeemer. And so if I take the weight and, the, and, and the, the cost of my sin, and I take that cost of my sin, that price has to be paid by somebody. It's got to be paid. It can't just go away. 
It doesn't just get magically erased. Something has to pay the price for my sin. Now, thankfully, I have Jesus as my redeemer, Jesus as my rescuer, as my coupon, as my voucher. And guess what? He's not a 20 rand or 20% off. He's 100% off. And so because of him, I'm not accountable for any of my sin. I don't have to pay the price of any of that. See, the most important player in this whole redemption game is the redeemer. It's Christ. It's the coupon. It's the voucher that I can take that out and I can say that I'm 100% paid for and covered. I don't owe anything on this. And so at the end of my life, when I go to cash it all in and I stand in front of the, the pearly gates on the golden road and I stand there, I can stand there completely redeemed because I've been bought back by Christ because he died for my sins. That's what makes him my redeemer. That's the first part of redemption. You need to understand that. Whether you have accepted him as your redeemer or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you've accepted rescue from Jesus or not, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus came and he died on the cross for us so that we could be in relationship and communion with him so that we can be without sin. I still sin and mess up. But guess what? My Redeemer covers all my future sins as well. That, that's, how, that's how amazing that is. See, as, as, as a sinner, someone that is not rescued, let me explain it to you this way. In case we have someone that's new to Christianity here in the room, I'll put it to you in very simple terms here. All right, so God is perfect. We believe God is completely perfect. And we believe that because God is so perfect, he can't hang out with imperfect people because that would introduce imperfection into him. So he's, he is in a bubble on his own. And if you look at the Old Testament, God would occupy like the, the Holy of Holies, which was a place in a tent. And if someone went in, they had a rope and a bell tied to them because sometimes if their heart wasn't in the right place or they touched the wrong thing, God, they just, boom, would get zapped dead. So they would have to go through this whole cleansing process in order for them to come into the presence of God. Because see, God, who's holy and perfect, can't interact with the imperfect. It's like at my house, we have a white couch. I also have a four-year-old. That four-year-old's feet are never clean. That four-year-old cannot interact with that white couch. It cannot interact with that white couch until it encounters Jesus, which is a washcloth. And when that child is washed clean by Christ, his feet are clean, he is now allowed on the couch. And that's kind of the way our relationship with Jesus is, the way our relationship with God is. And you know what? In God's eyes, it's probably that sweet and that gentle. God's saying, I want you, I, yeah, I want you to come sit on the couch with me. Come hang out. Come spend time with me. I love you. I made you. Be with me. Oh, you, you got a little smudge on you. Let me, I can take that smudge away. Let me just wipe it off. That's, that's rescue. That rescue brings redemption. And that's because we have this redeemer, the voucher. And part two, the second part to every redemption story is the value of the price paid to redeem you. This is the value of the, of the coupon or the voucher. And this is something that we're really, really disconnected from. And it, it makes sense as to why we're disconnected from it. Because see, we, we don't necessarily understand like the weight of what went into the gift that we're given, which is this redemption and this, this freedom. And we don't quite understand it. You know, so let me tell you a story about the weight of a gift that I do understand, that I understood in my life. Growing up, Christmas came one year, and it was a time of year my brother and I, we both got these really, really nice uh, rain jackets. It's like Gore-Tex rain jackets. We grew up in East Tennessee, which is tons of forest land. Uh, we were camping every weekend. We were outside all the time. And these jackets were like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. These were very, very expensive jackets. But I was going out and doing like seven, eight day long backpacking trips. And so in the mountains where, you know, so it was, we weren't just you know, having coffee in these things. I was really putting them to the test. And 
So Christmas morning, we, we got these jackets. It was like, you know, thank you. It's amazing. And then later that night, we went to my grandmother's house. And my grandmother was poor, incredibly poor. And she was a widower, and my parents paid her rent and everything. She, but she had nothing, nothing. This lady had no money at all. And we go there for Christmas, you know, every uh, Christmas afternoon. And while we were there, we get a gift from her. And we open up our gifts, and my brother and I both got these rain jackets. Now, it wasn't the same kind. These rain jackets were probably, you know, the equivalent of, you know, like a, we'd been given a, a 10,000 rand rain jacket from my parents. And then we go to my grandmother's and we get a, you know, 250 rand rain jacket from her. But guess what? Still to this day in my closet at my parents' house hangs that jacket that my grandmother gave me. Because I know what it cost her to give me that. And through the years and years and years of throwing clothes away, I've looked at that jacket and I said, I will never get rid of that because I know the cost. Do I know where that really expensive jacket that my parents got me went? And I don't, it either caught on fire or got lost or, was, or broke or was worn in. I don't know. I don't have it anymore. But I do have the one that my grandmother gave me because I know the value that went into the purchase of that. So we, we, when something means so much, when we realize the meaning behind the value, then it's, it's so much easier to cherish and hold on to that gift. And we, we just are really disconnected from the meaning, from the value of what Christ did for us. Because if we, and when I say we, I mean me too. 100% this is me as well. If, if every day I understood the value that went into Jesus paying that price for me, then it would be really, really, really hard for me to think a negative thought about myself. It would. It'd be almost impossible. But I'm pretty good at it. It'd be really, really hard for me to think a negative thought about like my situation or my life or to get down on uh, you know, major things happening or even things that aren't major that are happening. It'd be really hard because I understand the value and that value that Christ put into that voucher for me should outweigh everything in my life. And so if we feel disconnected from that, I don't want you to feel bad for that because that's, that's all of us. But that's an important part. And at the end of this message, we're going to get an opportunity to reconnect with that. And that's why that feeling that I'm talking about matters. I want us to feel what it's like to be rescued by Jesus. Because when you're really rescued, when you're really redeemed, when you, on Christmas evening, you open up that thing and you see that, that you know, 250 rand jacket and you know that your grandmother has zero money and you don't know how she got to the store to buy it. But she did somehow. When you look at that, it's like that is so valuable because I know what went into it. And that, that inspired a feeling in me that still to this day, probably 35 years later, that, that still means so much to me. Now, the, the third part to redemption is this, is how much are you worth? How much are you worth? See, this is where the value of the item that the coupon or a voucher is applied to. How, how much do you think that you're worth or not worth? Some of us don't think we're worth anything at all. Some of us think we're worth more than we actually are. Some of us need to be lifted up. Some of us need to be humbled. But how, how, the, the value of the item determines how valuable the voucher is. Because if we're talking about a 10 rand voucher on a 50 rand bag of bacon biltong, Versus, you know, um, you know, like a buy one, get one free dinner at, you know, the Husser Grill, you know. Last week I mentioned the bacon. Somebody actually did get me a bag of bacon. So I thought this week I would mention the Husser <laughs> and see if maybe somebody would, you know, would do that. But Casey and I received those things. We, that's fine. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. But I, I, I use that as kind of like an example for you guys. I, I, I want you to understand that there's, there's an expense. You, you are an expense. You cost somebody something. Now, you can choose to cost yourself, or you can choose to let it cost Jesus. Because Jesus is ready to pay the cost. He's ready to cover the bill, no matter how expensive or how cheap that it is. And the fact that, that he went and paid the highest price 
possible, meaning he left heaven and he came down and he gave his life for us. The fact that he paid the highest price possible. To me, it can only mean that you are the most valuable thing on earth. You're the most valuable thing in creation. Jesus didn't die for the trees or the wells or the mountain. He didn't die for any of that. Jesus died for you. The price was paid for you. You're the item. You're the value. You're, you're worth it to the rescuer, to the redeemer. And so for those of you wondering, are, are you too expensive to be redeemed? And the answer is that no, you're not. Redemption is for all of us. There's nothing that you could do where you could think Jesus could never cover this cost because I'm just too bad. I've done too much wrong. And because I've done this much that's wrong, I'm unforgivable. Your friend may tell you that. Your family may tell you that. Your spouse, or most importantly, you may tell yourself that, but it's just not the truth. You can walk in this room believing lies. My prayer is that when you walk out, you know the truth. And the truth is, is that not a single person in here is too expensive for the price that Jesus paid for you to be rescued and to be redeemed. And now to, to end this off, I want to do like a like kind of a, almost like a game, not a game, but a fun thing here. I want to do like a rapid fire redemption for you guys. And, and this rapid fire redemption is I'm just going to quickly spout out, spout out a bunch of people from the Bible. And, and you're going to see that in each and every one of them, there is a redemption story to them. And, and my hope is that one of those just triggers you. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any of them. But as I say it, if something identifies and if you say, okay, yeah, that feels like me there, then I want you to grab a hold of that for, for the end here. And so the first person we'll look at is Joseph. And through Joseph, we can understand that God will buy back your most difficult times. Well, see, Joseph was given a dream that Joseph would be a ruler over his brothers and over his family. But instead, Joseph got sold into slavery. And Joseph went to Egypt as a slave. But guess what? He didn't stay that way. God bought back his most difficult times, his difficult times in slavery. And it ended with Joseph actually being the ruler over his, over his family. In fact, Joseph was Pharaoh's right-hand guy. And look at what happens in Joseph's story here. We look in Genesis, in chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph is saying to his brothers in this exact moment, remember, these are the ones that threw him in a hole. And they were going to kill him. And instead they said, no, we're just going to sell him into slavery anyway. So he says, as for you, brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present outcome, meaning this moment right now between me and you, that many people would be kept alive as they are in this day. Because of Joseph, Egypt survived a famine and they even had enough to support other people that came to Egypt. See, God can redeem even the bad things, the hard things that happen in your life. Or what about Job? Maybe some of you can identify with Job. What we learned through Job and through Job's redemption is this. God can redeem anything in our stories, even the worst. You might think that Job is famous for having the worst of the worst happen to him. You know, I thought that my day yesterday, this week was rough. I got sick this week. Like I said, I broke my phone this week. I've got to put water in my radiator every time I drive from Pinelands to the gym at Canal Walk. I'm like, man, God, what's going on with my life here? And then I get reminded, you know, look at Job here. Job had everything stripped away and taken away from him. Everything, family, friends, possessions, even his own body fell to pieces. And still, God redeemed all of it, even the worst part in his story. And look at what Job gets now, he gets this after he prays to God, but look in, in chapter 42, verse 10. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job, and when he prayed for his friends, that's when Job had the fortunes restored to him. He prays for his friends. He gets his fortune restored, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Isn't that amazing? So when you find yourself in a place where life isn't working the way you thought it would, like Joseph, or in a place like Job where you just don't think it can get any worse, you're, you need to start remembering that when redemption comes, it uses the unexpected and it uses the worst of the worst. You can't outworse Job. You can't outworse God. God. God's got you no matter what. We can look at Ruth here. Ruth, we learned that through Ruth, through faithfulness, God redeemed her pain. If you don't know the story of Ruth, it's a special one. 
Ruth was so faithful to her mother-in-law, Naomi. That makes her special, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, if you really love Jesus, you'll love your mother-in-law. Yeah, Ruth is our example of that. So Ruth really loved Naomi, and she was faithful to Naomi, but she was also faithful to God. And so they went from having no land and having to go to another land, having no food and having to eat the scraps that are in the fields, having no possessions, nothing to their name. Ruth going out and just trying to um, keep herself safe and, and, and eat and glean wheat that was left over from the, from the farmers. To now she's introduced to the prince, to Boaz. He ends up marrying her. And then they end up getting literal redemption of their name because without a son, their name would fall away. And instead, God redeems, despite the pain, God redeemed their story. And we can see in chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer, a grandson, an heir. And today, and may his name become famous in all of Israel, and it did. And then we can look at Paul. Paul's my favorite person in the Bible because I think to myself, if God can use Paul, then I know that I've got a shot. I know that I've got a chance. And what we learn through Paul is that no matter what you've done, God can change you and he can use your story. And when you know Paul's past and that his whole purpose was to squash and kill out Christianity, and then God would use that same guy to then go and spread the gospel to places that it never would have gone that, that's amazing because God could have chosen anybody to do that. But he, he chose Paul, the guy that was trying to put it all down. God redeemed Paul. If he can use Paul, he can use you, he can use us. Noah, Noah's another one. See, when Noah was building the boat, Noah was inviting people to come alongside and build and enter the ark. But they all said no. So what we learn is that redemption is offered to anyone who is willing. Are you willing to be redeemed? Are you willing to accept God's rescue? Well, it's there for you. Now, unfortunately, for all of them, in Noah's case, the only people that got on the boat was his family and him. Everyone else didn't make it because they weren't willing. You know, we can look at Abraham and Isaac, and we can see that God redeems through the, the gift of his son because Abraham was told to take his son Isaac, who at the time was about 30 years old, to go up and to sacrifice him. And just before that sacrifice, a lamb shows up and, and takes the place of Isaac. You know, just before our sacrifice, just before we can't have communion with God, a lamb by the name of Jesus shows up and redeems us so that no price has to be paid because the sacrifice has already been made. You know, later in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus is telling a story about leaving the 99 for the one. And what this is, is a story about sheep. And he's giving the, the, this illustration because it's not enough just to have uh, 99 and know that one got away. The, the good shepherd goes after the one that gets away. And the redemption story from that is that Jesus is telling us that lost sheep, that's us before Christ, we're lost sheep. They need to be found and they need to be redeemed. So many of us feel like we're alone and we're just out running away and that nobody knows that we're running. And nobody in your life may know, but Jesus does. And Jesus is chasing after you. But are you going to stop and let him catch you? Because if you will, he wants to rescue you. He wants to redeem you. And so how, how do we become redeemed? How, how to be redeemed? It, this, is, this is easy. To be redeemed is to be rescued. And to be rescued, it requires faith. So guess what? Look how easy this is. Faith is the hand that grabs the coupon. See, this voucher is 100% off. That is Christ. It's like, do you, it's ready for you. Do you want this? Do you want this in your life? Faith is this. That's all it is. Saying, I believe that this does what it says it will. I believe that this takes away and discounts what it says it will. I believe that if you say there's no price to pay, then I believe it and I take it. It's having a little bit of faith and taking what Christ is offering us. And then for, for me, most importantly, is how do we feel redeemed? The, the way that we feel redeemed. See, this, this is what makes it so easy for me. I don't have to do anything here. I, I have no part to play. 
and you feeling redeemed. And you being redeemed, I've got a, I, there's a place that I can play. I can lead you in a prayer. I can teach you things, all that stuff. But for you to feel redeemed, the only way that's going to happen is through an encounter with Christ, through an encounter with the Holy Spirit. When you bump up against God, that's when you feel redeemed. The only way this morning that, that this is going to be any more than just words coming from a broken voice is because God catches these words midair and he goes with them to you. And if you feel like this has stirred your heart or it's applied to you or you can identify with any of it, well, that's, that's God calling out to you. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to enter into a time of worship. And this time of worship is set up so that you and Jesus can have an encounter. You know, go back to the couch. God's sitting on the couch. He doesn't see you as this horrible person. He sees you as his child. And you just got a little bit of dirt on you. And he just wants to wipe it off. That's it. All we have to do is just put a little bit of faith in him and reach out and grab that hand and accept it. And when we do, rescue happens immediately. And when we're rescued, redemption happens immediately. Every sin that ever was and will and will be is covered and paid. It's done for you. All you have to do is get on the couch. Just let him wipe you off. It really is that simple. So I just want us to bow our heads and close our eyes as we pray. And I just want to lead a prayer for those of you that have never been rescued and you'd like to be rescued. You're, you're, you've you been out at sea long enough. You're tired of not being rescued. You're tired of trying to rescue yourself. And if you're ready for that moment in your life, then as I pray this, you just pray it in your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm tired of floating on my own. I'm tired of not being rescued. And so Jesus, today, I want to accept your rescue. And so with faith, Jesus, I just, I put my faith in you, that you will rescue me. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Take all of my heart. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And I give my life to you. Thank you, Jesus, for rescuing me and for redeeming me and buying back all of my sin. And for those of you that, that maybe you've been redeemed, you've been a Christian for a long time, but maybe you just need a reminder. I know I do sometimes. Then I just pray that as we sing this next two songs, as we worship, that God will have an encounter with you and you'll be reminded. And so Heavenly Father, I pray over every eye and ear and heart in this room that your Holy Spirit would move and that people would just have an encounter with you. Lord, let everyone in here feel your presence in a unique way that's unique to them, specially tailored to each individual in here. Father, I know you love everybody and I'd give anything in the world for everybody to have an open heart to receive that love. So we just Speak the authority of your name, Jesus, over every distraction, over every burden that everyone carries. I just pray, Father, that you move. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Guys, please stand and join us as we worship.